see you all today. Why don't, we, um, why don't we just start with prayer. God, we're grateful for your presence here today, and we're grateful for the fact that you are a good and beautiful God. We pray that you will be in our, our thoughts, our discussion, and, and we thank you that you are transforming us. We pray uh, that your Holy Spirit would continue that process in us. So we thank you for this next chapter to study and for each person that's, um, that's put in time this week doing both the soul training but also the reading. Uh, help, help this process to be something that brings about change in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have to admit that um, this chapter, chapter 8, is where I start to, it's, it's one of the more fun chapters to me. In fact, this chapter and next chapter are two of the reasons that I really, really liked the book, although I really liked the others as well. But this, this whole idea of transformation, you know, my, um, my title here at the church is uh, uh, Associate Pastor of Spiritual Growth and Development, and it carries within it the idea that we're going to grow and develop, right, in our spiritual life. So I think that that's really an important thing for us to think about. And um, a lot of times in churches, what happens is people sort of come and join a church. You know, they maybe make a profession of Christ as Lord. And then it's sort of like, that's it. That's the end. But, but the reality is that a lot of times those things are really the beginning of all the things that God's going to do in our lives. And so, so today, this um, discussion about, you know, how do we see ourselves and all this thing I think is really important. And um, although he doesn't say it, I think um, Jim Smith's, a lot of his research comes from a guy named Neil Anderson, who I knew in Southern California. And Neil was a Christian psychologist, and he would often walk up to people at a party or something, and he would say to them, he would say, um, who are you? And, mm -hmm. and they would say something like this. They would say, well, I'm a realtor, or I'm you know, a stay-at-home mom, or I'm a homemaker, or I'm a lawyer. And he would say, wait, he'd say, that's not who you are, that's what you do. Now, you know, he's really a, a sort of a pain at parties. You know? <laughs> but, but his point was interesting, because what he was saying was this, which I think is important for us to hear, is that we so many times define ourselves based on what we do, rather than who we are. This chapter really gets down to that, that sort of depth of, uh, of identity. Who are we as Christians? And, and he specifically begins to lay it out in this whole idea of, do I see myself as a sinner? Do I see myself as a saint? Now, those oftentimes seem like very polar opposites, but today we're going to try to pull that together and think about that in a different way. Here's what I'd like to start with after, you know, this whole idea of identity. What this means is that my sin doesn't have to define who I am. It also means that my brokenness, remember his illustration about brokenness and how his friend always would have the students at the college beat up this box, but then they would put a light inside and it would show through. Our brokenness doesn't have to define us. Even our addictions do not have to define us. What really defines us is the fact that we are people that are in a relationship with this good and beautiful God. And, and what defines us then is the fact that we are children of God. And I guess that's part of my prayer for all of us in this study, is that that whole idea of being a child of God would become very pivotal in your life. That that would, that would be a deep feeling for you. Now, he starts off, of course, with the, um, he starts off with this whole narrative about, you know, are we sinners? And, um, and that's the false narrative that he's getting to, is that we tend to see ourselves only as sinners. It's not that we have stopped sinning, but we're no longer defined by our sin. And he gives this great quote by Greg Jones um, on chapter, or page 153, where he says this, To be forgiven by God, to be initiated in the life in God's kingdom, is to be transferred from one narrative, the narrative of, dealing, of death dealing sin, to the narrative of God's reconciliation in Christ. And in that latter narrative, we are forgiven of our sin so that we can learn to become holy through lifelong repentance and forgiveness. So what he's saying in a nutshell is that, you know, this whole idea of being in Christ, and we'll talk about that in a second, transfers us from this whole realm of just seeing ourselves as sort of ruined, rotten sinners, 
into looking at ourselves as saints. And we'll have to define what saint means as well. But notice the difference there. Notice the difference there. Now, I can tell you, I've, I've been a part of churches that talked about this in different ways. I did, you know, that whole ruined, rotten sinner word I used, that phrase. That was used every week in a church I was pastoring where I was one of the associates by the head of staff. And every week he'd talk about, you know, we're just ruined, rotten sinners. And, um, and it, was just a, it was just one of those things like, you know, yeah, that's who we are. Oh, man. It's horrible. You know? and, and I'll tell you, the, the other thing that happens with that, which is sort of subliminal, but what ha or subconscious, is that you start to then be a ruined, rotten sinner, you know, and, and it's sort of normal to be a ruined, rotten sinner. And, but, but there's also this sort of sense of, of depreciating this, this God part as well. So now, I had an interesting thing happen. When I started a church um, here in Pennsylvania, one day I, I preached a sermon on holiness, and, um, and I told the whole congregation, I said, you're all saints. And so I said, you know, like, you're St. Lori and St. Bill and St. Ed and, you know, St. Teresa, and, um, and they hated that. <laughs> and, and because they had this whole idea of what a saint was, that a saint was somebody who had to have performed certain miracles, you know, had, had to really have sacrificed their life. And so I realized, too, that oftentimes we don't understand what the word saint means. So, so here's a simple definition of what saint is. Um, saint does refer to this whole word so holiness. It does come from that. Like, for example, a saint is someone who is holy. And holy itself, that word in the Greek, actually means to be set apart. So, so saints are people that have been set apart, okay? Now, the interesting thing about that is, a lot of times we think about what we've been set apart from. Okay, so this is, I mean, follow with me here because this is important. We always think about we've been set apart from all the bad stuff, right? So what happens is we tend to define a saint by somebody who doesn't do certain bad things. But that's not what a saint is. Saints are those who have been made holy because of what Christ has done for them. Christ by going through all he went through has given us, has, has declared that we are holy. You are holy in God's sight. But a saint is not just someone who's set apart from things. The other flip of that is that a saint is someone who is set apart towards something. And this is the part that's often left out. So we are set apart towards God. We are now in this new relationship with God where, where it's God's holiness that's transferred to us so that we're no longer chained and bound by sin that's been broken in our lives so that now we can by the power of the holy spirit you know make the right choices we we've been restored and forgiven and reclaimed and transformed by god so that we're living into this new reality and i you know it, it ought to today sometime at your um at your small group refer to each other as Saint, you know, Saint Karen and Saint Julie. I mean, you know, I, I think that would be fun to do. It's not, it's not to elevate us. It, it's really to just affirm what it is that we see God doing in us and how it is that God sees us. When, when God looks at you, God looks at you as, as a holy beloved child. God doesn't look at you as some rotten person that God's got to deal with. God looks at you through Christ as, as one of God's holy and beloved children. So one of the things, and, and part of the reason I really like this um, chapter is because he refers to this whole phrase in Christ. And actually, in my doctoral stuff, I have to write a lot about that. So it was fun to, you know, to see that was part of in the whole selection of the book. But Paul uses this interesting phrase all the time in his letters to um, the churches. He uses this phrase of being in Christ. And, and it's this whole idea of being immersed in this whole new relationship with Jesus Christ. He uses it somewhere around 160 times. So it's very pivotal to him. He'll, he'll talk about how we are no longer who we used to be, but now we are in Christ. And so it's from that sort of center of being in Christ that salvation and everything else um, comes. In fact, one writer said this, that Paul is not merely saying these people believed in Christ. It's not just like, you know, I believed in Christ, but now we are positionally actually in this relationship with Christ. It becomes our identity of who we are. That Christ, we are a Christ 
person. We are someone who's been claimed by Christ, and Christ is at work in us and also through us to love and bless the world. So that whole identity of being Christian, you know, Christian means little Christ or Christ follower, that, that whole identity becomes who we are and how we understand ourselves. He goes on, and you know, we could do this for a long time, but let me just give you a couple highlights. I mean, Paul talks about that in Christ we're, you know, we are bought back, we, we're regenerated, that, that in Christ we're justified, that, that all the things that have been held against us have been, have been you know, removed, that we're new. Um, he says that in Christ we have died to sin. In Christ we have been raised to new life. In Christ we have eternal life. And then he also says that in Christ, we're a new creation. We're a new creation. So, so think about yourself that way, that, that God is bringing about in you also a new creation. I'm going to flip ahead here for a second. Well, maybe I'm not. Hold on. Let's continue working. That'll work. It may not do that. Well, maybe it will. Yeah. Okay. Let me just tell you. I had some pictures of butterflies on there. So, did you get a chance to see the butterfly? Uh, you know, it's interesting that whole picture or that metaphor of a butterfly really is a good thing for thinking about transformation. And, and the, I love the phrase. You know, you're not just a worm with, with wings. wings. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. That's good. Uh, but you know, in in the Bible, there is this whole sense of being transformed or of being conformed. What, one way to look at it is, in fact, if you're in chapel today, Don read out of Jeremiah, talked about the potter that forms the clay. Well, one of the things that God is doing is God is forming us into the people of God. That's one thing God's doing. But the other thing God's doing is actually transforming and changing us as well. So the whole idea of the butterfly, I love the chrysalis, you know, the, the, the um, caterpillar forms this whole chrysalis and then there's this metamorphosis that takes place in that chrysalis so that when the um, caterpillar emerges again, it's no longer a caterpillar, now it's a butterfly. And, and it comes out with wings and, you know, we did this one year with our girls. We got one of those nets and we bought, you know, the little caterpillars and they all did their thing and, and then they began to come out and they come out all sticky and then they sort of, you know, they flutter their wings and they get to where they can fly and then eventually you've got to let them go or they're just not going to make it. And, and I think that's a great illustration of this whole idea that we are in Christ a new creation, that, that God has taken all the old and taken it away and, and has transformed us. And one of the interesting things about that is that word metamorphosis is actually used in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's that word in the Greek, it's the word metamorphosis, the very same word that's used oftentimes to describe, you know, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. So, so think about it that way also, that God is in the midst of transforming and bringing about a whole new creation in you. And of course, you know, it's a great thing, you know, the illustration's deep, you can play with it a lot, you know, the caterpillars on the ground crawling around, the butterflies up soaring, you know, on the the breeze, you know, uh, it's really the kind of freedom, I think, and joy that God wants to give us as well in life. So, so claim that and, um, and start to think about that uh, as you're thinking about this whole passage. The other thing that he says is that, um, that I thought was good was that we also then begin to have, we abide and have our life deeply invested in the life of Christ. And he quotes John chapter 15 about the vine and the branches. And I, I would encourage you in your groups to talk about that passage as well. Um, the thing that I think so stark about that passage is it's just so clear. It says, if a branch is not connected to the vine, it dies. And so that's, again, you know, that's our soul training. It's, it's the connection to the vine that continues to give us, you know, the spiritual nourishment and nutrients that we need to keep a vital, um, a vital life in Christ. He uh, quoted James Stewart. He says, um, 
about this whole idea of Christ in me, he says that Christ in me means something quite different from the weight of an impossible ideal. Christ in me means Christ bearing me along from within. You see, there's that vine and the branch, isn't it? Christ within us is bearing us along. Christ, the motive power that carries me on. Christ giving my whole life a wonderful poise and lift, turning every burden into wings, everything so that we can release it, so it doesn't, it doesn't drag us down, but we find new power to deal with things. Not as something you have to bear, but as something by which you are born. And so God continues to work and bring about new life in us. Now he ends this um, passage a little bit sort of on a heavy note, but he's really building for the ninth chapter. It's next week already, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so he's, maybe you're thinking, oh no, it's been a long time. <laughs> it's gone by quick for me. Um, but he says this, he says that old narratives are often hard to change. But he says the best approach is to keep soaking in the truth of our identity in Christ, practicing spiritual disciplines that deepen those truths, and being part of a community that will reinforce those truths. And I totally affirm that. I think that one of the things that we can do is continue to, to bask, to, uh, to ruminate, to allow this whole new identity of what it means to be Christ's person uh, to be driven deep into us. And so, so today, I hope, um, and my prayer for you is that when you think of yourself, you'll think of yourself, first of all, as a child of God, that you are God's beloved child in whom God is very delighted, and that that identity that we have as sons and daughters of God would be the thing that would be driven into us, but also becomes the thing then that's enacted through us as we also try to bless uh, as we join in what God's doing to bless and love the world as well. So this next week, the soul training exercise is just to slow down. <laughs> it's just to slow down, um, you know, to sort of see what your pace is and figure out if it's too much. And, um, and remember again that it's, you know, it's in the slowing down that we begin to hear. Uh, it's in the slowing down that we start to see it's in the slowing down that we all, we oftentimes meet God uh, in the moment. So God's best to you as you do that this week. Let, let's pray and then we'll do some question and answer. God, I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart. I pray, God, that you would enable us to, uh, to understand your love in a new and deep way. And I thank you that you have put your of your greatness, your power in us, that you are at work in us, that, that the same power by the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is also at work in us. So we ask you to solidify our identity in you, but also um, to raise us with Christ, that our lives might be transformed by his power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.